I'm an Eric. Um, I'm known on the internet as Badboy underscore. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I do organize a lot of stuff, uh, such as meetups and conferences for the Rust uh, language. I'm working as a software engineer for a very small company in Germany, in Dortmund. But today I'm here as, and my function is a Mozilla tech speaker. And as such, I'm here to talk to you about WebAssembly. You already saw me uh, interacting with the Zen Garden demo over there. That was actually WebAssembly running in my Firefox browser. Now, if you're into web development or browser development, you probably have heard of it. Given that you're in the room, um, you seem at least interested in hearing about it. So today, I'm here to talk to you about what WebAssembly is, why we need it, and how to use it. So what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a lot of things. First off, it's a new binary executable format for the web. That means it allows you to take your existing code in another language, compile it, and run it um, in your browser. WebAssembly is also general purpose virtual architecture. That sounds quite crude, but what it actually means is that the semantics and the definition behind WebAssembly are not bound to the web, even though they are intended to rerun on the web, but they give you um, uh, an infrastructure to build general applications. It allows to be embedded into other engines, which is also used to embed it into JavaScript engines right now to get it running in your browser. But you can also imagine an engine that runs completely separate from your browser um, and be a target for your laptop or for your smartphone app. It's best to think of WebAssembly as a compiler target. As I already mentioned, you can take your existing code, for example, C or C++, or even Rust code, throw that into your compiler, and out you get a WebAssembly module. This WebAssembly module you can load in your browser, and it will run. How to do that, we will see in the end. But when I'm talking about WebAssembly, what I also mean is WebAssembly is an open standard. It's developed by a W3C community group out in the open. The group formed around two years ago um, and started to work on WebAssembly. Um, all the discussions were out in the open. You could follow along on GitHub, in the IRC channel, or in the mailing list, and bring your own ideas or assumptions against um, such a project into it. And even for the continuing development, you can still do that. It's still all open on GitHub. You can propose your own ideas and shape how WebAssembly will be implemented. And what I mean when I talk about an open standard, what I also mean is there are um, folks from all major browser vendors in this community group shaping WebAssembly, defining it, implementing it. WebAssembly was standardized uh, with version 1 in just February. And a week later, uh, Mozilla shipped a release of Firefox that had it enabled already. Just a week later, again, uh, Google shipped a release of Chrome that enabled it as well. It's now also available in the latest Microsoft Edge release behind the feature flag, so you can start testing it out there. And just yesterday, I was informed it will go live there in the fall as well. And as far as I know, it's also in the latest Safari technology preview, so you can even run it under OS X in Safari if you want to. But there are also things that WebAssembly is not. First off, WebAssembly is definitely not a full replacement for JavaScript. Web applications that are already written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript for the foreseeable future. WebAssembly is not the golden way for all the applications out there. WebAssembly is also not a programming language. Even though it can be used as such, it's intended to be modified by tools and be the output of certain tools, not the output of what you write. When getting started with WebAssembly, it's probably making sense to at least look how it's written and what it means when written down. But um, probably in half a month, no one will write WebAssembly by himself or themselves. And WebAssembly is also not a very good target for every dynamic language out there. If you already have a language that compiles to JavaScript in some other way, for example, CoffeeScript or TypeScript or some of the other script languages out there, 
um, they will still be uh, better off compiling to JavaScript and running that in the browser than compiling to WebAssembly. The overhead of WebAssembly uh, as a target there would be far too much. So why would we need WebAssembly in the first place? For that, we need to take a step back in history to see how we got to the point where we are. First, there was JavaScript, invented in 1995. It was used to uh, extend websites um, with certain dynamic features. It was, very, um, it was used for very specific use cases, very small use cases. The engines back then were very um, simple, were mostly interpreters for JavaScript. They were not fast, they were quite slow actually, but it was uh, totally fine for the use case at hand, just making certain things on a website more dynamic. But people started to put more and more of this JavaScript into their websites. They built whole applications using JavaScript. So the browsers had to keep up and make their JavaScript engines faster to um, run in a way that users um, would actually like using these applications in their browsers. Then in 2008, Google released their V8 engine. It was a new JavaScript engine that used just-in-time compilation for a large part of the JavaScript to compile down to very efficient native code and run on your laptop or now also on your smartphone or on several other devices you can think of. And from that point on, we got larger and larger web applications, ranging all from your Office suite to your Google, uh, to your mail client, to your image editing, um, or your full um, development environment. You can all do it in the browser right now. That's thanks to all these engines speeding up the execution of JavaScript. That's, that was also the time when people started to compile other code into JavaScript to run it on the, on the browser. There were several different tools to do that, but in the end, all had to compile to JavaScript because that was the only language a browser could understand. A bit later, there's another product that came out of all of this. It was called ASMJS. It started as a more research pro project in Mozilla, and it specified a concrete subset of JavaScript that a browser or a JavaScript engine could detect and optimize quite uh, to a quite performant code to run on your laptop or again the smartphone. At best, it even compiled it to the native code that you would expect uh, the same code written in C would uh, output. Two of the main features of uh, ASMJS are annotations for functions and for variables and for expressions and a flat memory space. So we're going to take a look at these two um, things because they are still relevant for how we execute WebAssembly today. So first, the type annotations. If you write JavaScript, you know you don't need to add the types to your data. The JavaScript engine will automatically infer what type you are using and will do the, most of the time the right thing um, when you use them. But this actually makes things quite complex to optimize because the engine also has to infer all the types and it has to accommodate all types you can actually put in there. Take a look at this simple uh, function. It's called add. It takes two parameters, x and y, and it just um, uses the plus operator on them and returns the result. Now, if you pass into numbers, it's pretty simple. They will get added and the sum will return. But if you pass into strings, they will actually get concatenated because there is not, no such thing as a summation of uh, strings. So the plus operator on strings is defined differently. But now if you take a number as an input and the string as uh, the other input or an object or something similar, funny things will happen. It's not clear what you actually wanted to, the engine to do. The engine still has to do the right thing and call the plus operator with what it knows. But it just can't um, use the simple add operation on numbers anymore because it does not have any numbers. But we can uh, help the engine here to make this decision. We, can, and we can, can add annotations to the code. These are some simple annotations. We add a binary or zero to our input variables and also to the return expression. And the, the thing about this is a binary or only makes sense if you're having numbers. And binary oring with a zero doesn't change this number at all. 
So what we're telling the engine here is that we actually have numbers, and what we will return is also a number. Now the engine can go ahead and say, OK, we're working with numbers. So we just use the add operation that our CPU provides to run this code. Now if you do this for all your code, the engine can infer the types by the simple annotations you add and compile that to the native code uh, of your CPU. Of course, you don't want to add them manually. So there are tools out there that will take your code and add these annotations. This now also allows us to take other code, compile it to JavaScript with these annotations, and let the engine do the right thing there. And this is actually part of the specification of ASMJS. ASMJS specifies types by adding these type annotations to JavaScript. It's still JavaScript, but if detected, the engine can run it faster. Firefox actually does this ahead of time. So if you annotate your code with ASMJS, and it's actually ASMJS code, uh, Firefox will compile it down to native code. Chrome has a similar mode. It will just do it uh, just in time, but it will speed up just as well. The other thing I mentioned, the other feature of ASMJS is the linear memory access. Again, if you're writing JavaScript, you also often don't care much about how you use your data. You use object, you use strings, you use numbers just as you want, and when you don't want them, you don't have to do anything. The engine will stop your code at some point and will run the garbage collector. The garbage collector will go through all the data that is there, see what's not used anymore, and remove it. But this can be quite unpredictable. It can cause delays in the execution of your functions. And if you uh, create a lot of objects, you will create a lot of garbage, and these uh, stops will uh, become longer and longer. So you want to avoid uh, garbage as best as possible. Now, what ASMJS does is instead of having a lot of objects around, it has just one object around. And that is just a large memory buffer. This large memory buffer, from the point of view of the engine, looks like it's in use all the time, because there's always a reference to this buffer somewhere. But what's actually happening is that your code places its own data somewhere in this buffer. It then can put in four bytes, which, for example, represent an integer, and read them out later when it needs them. It can also put in more bytes, which construct a whole object for your application. But this data will never be freed on its own by the garbage collector. It's then up to your code, or the higher level code, to implement management of this memory buffer. And even though this causes overhead in that you have to allocate this memory buffer once, but if you have a smart application and you're actually using all parts of this memory buffer, you would have the same amount of memory used in raw JavaScript code anyway. So let's take a look how this translates um, if you're coming from C. Um, if you're coming from C, you probably know strings, which are actually just pointers into memory, and uh, strings then are always terminated with a zero byte. So to take the length of the string, what you have to do is just go along the whole string, find the null byte, and see how long you went. So if a very naive implementation of the string length function, it just takes the uh, pointer to the string as an input. It then just in increments uh, this pointer until it hits the null byte. And then it just abstracts uh, the current position from the old position, which, and the difference is just the length of the string. This is pretty simple in, in C, and actually pretty efficient. Now that if we want to translate the same code to ASMJS, it looks like this. Again, you see our annotations. Our pointer becomes a simple number by binary oring again. And we now have our large buffer, which is called the heap, which is a simulation of the heap that's also available in C. And again, our pointer is now just an index into this buffer. So we can just increment this index until we hit the zero byte again. We can uh, do the difference between our two pointers into this buffer. And we got our length of the string again. And at, at no point in this code, we actually constructed a JavaScript object by itself. So we didn't uh, produce any garbage. So 
uh, you don't have to worry about actually writing code like this because there are tool chains out there that will take your C code and produce this code. And you don't actually have to write the uh, string length function yourself because it's already provided by the C environment. And the tool chain will provide a similar thing in your compiled code anyway. So why don't we just use ASMGS with these things we have? There are advantages. After all, it's just pure JavaScript. So every engine out there that's actually running JavaScript can also run ASMGS without problems. It might not speed uh, them up, but it will run them. And for those that do understand ASMGS, it can speed them up quite significantly. Um, the engines in both Firefox and Chrome can speed up ASMGS to a point where they're comparable to the same speed of native applications. But there are disadvantages as well. Um, the specification of ASMJS is very informal. There was never a broad consensus of the specification and on the implementation of the specification. This also means you don't have any speed guarantees. You can't rely on the browser being able to optimize your code. And because it's still just JavaScript, it's very hard to extend. We can't just add features to JavaScript. We also have to keep in mind that JavaScript is running everywhere and should run everywhere for the foreseeable future. So we can't just add things that would break it. And there are things missing, for example, 64-bit integers, which would be heavily used in physics or mass calculations, but we simply don't have them in JavaScript. We can emulate them to some extent, but this simply won't be fast but our CPUs are pretty good at doing 64-bit mass by now. So why WebAssembly? WebAssembly is designed in a way that it's um, actually even smaller than ASMJS compressed, even though ASMJS compressed can be quite small. Uh, the binary format of WebAssembly gar mostly guarantees that it will be smaller than the same code in ASMJS. It's also a lot of faster to parse WebAssembly than it's uh, possible to parse JavaScript. And it's already a compiled and very strict format. We more or less just need a uh, check run to see if it's actually valid um, WebAssembly code, and then we're done. And we now have the freedom to extend this language with the features we need. And as mentioned before, there is a formal specification, and we have all major browser vendors on board implementing the same specification. So we hope that all the browsers will actually run your code the same way. Now let's take a look at actual use cases for WebAssembly. You already saw me playing around with the little Zen Garden simulation there, which was a full 3D application, very interactive. There are other games out there, such as a tanks demo or a small 3D shooter. So you can actually play these games in your browser. You just have to download the assets once, and then you can play. And hopefully in the future, you can also play large games just in your browser. You don't have to install another application. You can just use your browser, browse to the website, maybe log into your account and start playing. You can also think of a lot of multimedia applications that would, um, can be speed up by using WebAssembly. Think about your image or video editing platform or think about live video augmentation, or we have some VR uh, demos out there. They could also profit from WebAssembly, as there is a lot of CPU-intensive calculations going on there. And one thing when we're coming to WebAssembly, it's always performance. WebAssembly code should compile down to native code so we can expect the same performance. And we need these performance for things like security or encryption algorithms or compression algorithms. And with WebAssembly, we can now move them to the browser and have them accessible everywhere. And of course, there are a large amount of libraries out there that are already written in C or in C++. They have uh, hours and hours of work uh, thrown into them for the past few years. And we probably just want to reuse them instead of spending another um, work hours to translate them to JavaScript. Like one recent example I saw is there's an image format for medical images called DCOM, which has a huge, huge SDK, 
which you can use to implement uh, viewers or parsers for this format. But it's quite old, and it's written in C. And someone took this code and compiled it to WebAssembly, and uh, they are now building a web application around this parser to actually view or modify or extend these images in your browser. This would allow them to use this on your smartphone, on your laptop, on your tablet, on every device that um, has a browser. And as mentioned before, we can now add 64-bit masks, which are quite useful in some encryption or security algorithms and in physics calculations or in some um, simulators. So now that you know what WebAssembly is and why we want to use it and what you can use it for, let's take a look how to actually use it. I mentioned before, it's the simplest way to just use the compiler. If you got C code, if you got C++ code, or if you got Rust code, um, you can take your compiler and uh, instruct it to output WebAssembly. Now, there are first implementations for both GCC and Clang to output WebAssembly, but they are pretty alpha. They will stabilize over the summer, but they are not, uh, in a way, usable for most of the end users now. But there is another tool. Um, and it's called mscripten. mscripten is an open source LLVM based uh, compiler from C and C++ and now also Rust. And it outputs JavaScript, but it also outputs ASMGS and it outputs WebAssembly. And what, Web, what mscripten adds around all that is also a lot of shims or um, additional functionality so you can actually use your existing code without needing to add more and more libraries to make it work on the web. It provides um, frameworks such as OpenGL translations to WebGL. It provides a file system layer. If you run it in a browser, it will just use local storage or IndexedDB or what's available. Um, it could even use the native file system functionality if it's available in the browser, and so on and so on. This is all already done by mscript. So let's see how to use it. Again, we're taking a look at C code. And this is a very, very simple function. It's called half, and it takes an integer called x. It divides it by two and returns the result as an integer again. That's not very complicated, but it's enough to get us started and to see how this translates to WebAssembly and how to run it. Now, if you take the C code and want to compile it to native code, you could use Clang, uh, pass some flags, tell it to output an object file, and it will compile your code and um, save this object file. This object file can then be linked to your actual application and it calls the half function to uh, divide the number by, z by two. Now, if you want to turn it into WebAssembly, you call the mscripten compiler. The mscripten compiler is called emcc. You just pass a few more flags, tell it where to save, and outputs a WebAssembly module. Now, what mscripten actually outputs is this. If you do like to write, read binary code, and you maybe even know a bit about how mscripten um, encodes certain things, you can read this. But don't worry, I'll explain what this actually means. So every WebAssembly program is actually called a module. That's just a terminology they use. A module then always consists of uh, a bit of metadata, um, things like imports and exports, some memory declarations. Um, it can also declare initial values for the memory it's using, and then it contains the actual code. So in the binary version, each module always starts with the magic header. It's actually just the zero byte followed by the ASCII string ASM. When the browser downloads such a file, it reads the magic header and knows there should be a WebAssembly file in there, and it tries to use it as a WebAssembly file. This is then followed by four bytes indicating the version number of WebAssembly. With what we have recently stabilized, we are at version 1, which you can uh, also see there. And hopefully, this won't change too often. So WebAssembly was uh, built in a way that it's extendable, but at best without breaking any old WebAssembly. So this code uh, should be quite stable, and the version should be stable as well, even with more and more features being put into WebAssembly. 
But if we need to break it at some point, we do have the functionality there to uh, just use a new version. Now, if you look further down, you can see the word half. And this is now actually the export section. Functions in your WebAssembly code are always exported by name, so you can actually grab them from the JavaScript side and access them and execute them. And last in the module, there's the code. And these six bytes over here is all it takes to get a number, divide it by two, and return it. Now, right from the start, there was always um, the problem of we don't really want to ship a pure binary to the browser, as we are used to just view the source in your browser to see how a website is implemented, to see what code it is actually running. So right from the start, there was a one-to-one -one mapping of this binary representation to an actual text representation of the WebAssembly code as well. If you know some Lisp, this should be quite familiar. They decided to also use S expressions to um, show this code um, as it uh, circumvented any discussions about the actual syntax. But even if you don't know Lisp, this should be quite easy to follow as well. So let's take a look. Again, on the top, you see some metadata. It declares some table. It speaks about the memory and about the exports. And you also see that it's exporting our half function. And this export is actually pointing to the dollar half function further down. This is just some encoding efficiency in the WebAssembly format that we have the export at one point and the actual code below. We can also have functions in the WebAssembly that are not exported at all. So if you look further down, we see our actual code. And it just takes three instructions. The diff instruction, a get local instruction, and a const instruction to divide our number by two. So what this does is it calls the division operator on a 32-bit integer with two arguments. The first argument actually first gets the past value from $0. And the second argument just takes the constant integer 2. It's passed to the Division operator, the division operator does its work as best it's an actual division operator of the CPU, and then returns the result. And the last expression of this function is also the full result of the function, so the result will be returned when half is called. The order in the binary is actually a bit switched around, but that's more or less just for efficiency reasons, and this representation is um, close enough and readable enough that uh, it will act as the um, view source of WebAssembly. Now, to execute JavaScript, you need an actual API on the JavaScript side. And that looks like this. First, we are fetching our module from the server using fetch. We can then turn it into an array buffer, basically just an array implementation inside of JavaScript. We then compile it. This step is also doing the check that it's actually valid WebAssembly code, and it then already compiles it at best to native code, and then we instantiate a module, basically just getting a handle to the code we just um, compiled. And at last, we can access the exports of our module and call functions and putting in actual JavaScript um, integers that get turned into integers on the WebAssembly side and called into the function. Now that this is all in the browser, we can actually execute it here. So um, the same code you see here is also on this uh, slide, so we can actually run it. And we're now calling half with 128, and obviously the uh, divided by two, that gives us 64. So we now just run WebAssembly in the browser. No, I'm not much of a uh, C or C++ coder anymore, but more into Rust. And I'm very happy to say that we do have uh, the functionality in Rust that you can actually output WebAssembly as well. It will use web, uh, mscript in the back end, um, so you still need to have that installed. But otherwise, you can still use the tooling around Rust. Um, it, I put up some resources about that on hellorust.com slash wasm. And speaking of tooling, there are already tools out there to help get you started. First, there's the Wasm Explorer. It's basically um, a development environment allowing you to write C or C++ code. Um, it then shows you the WebAssembly code and also the x86 assembler code, so you can actually compare it. 
So should you implement a compiler for WebAssembly or an engine for WebAssembly, this is probably a good way to get started to see what it should output. Um, I will upload the slides and the links so you will um, find those tools as well. Um, another tool which uh, should get you started and which will hopefully expand um, over the life of WebAssembly is Wasm Fiddle. It's quite similar to JS Fiddle. It allows you to write your code and share links to it. It uh, allows you to write the C part of the code and the front end part of the code. And in between, it will compile it to WebAssembly to let you run it. Um, this is on a heavy development. It just broke last week um, for some reason, and now it's working again. So uh, be a bit careful, but this should get you started without you needing to install any tools locally. And now before I wrap up, um, I want to quickly look at WebAssembly's future, because what we have now is just version one of WebAssembly. But right from the start, version one was indi uh, indicated to be just a minimal working version of WebAssembly to get it off the ground. But features were already envisioned. One of these features, for example, would be threads. Threading support would allow you to uh, safely, in a sandboxed environment of your browser, allow to use all the cores in your browser. You can, to some extent, uh, emulate that in JavaScript today by using service workers. Um, but if you have your C code that is already using threads, um, it's a lot more complicated to get the same functionality in your browser. With future WebAssembly support, even this code, the threaded code, could work in your browser efficiently. Another thing would be SIMD support. Uh, SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, and it basically allows you to do a single operation on multiple values um, at, at one time. It allows, for example, to work with 128-bit vectors and do some uh, math operations on them. CPUs implement instructions for this, and which are, can quite speed up your code, and there will be support in WebAssembly in the future as well. To all make this actually working, and uh, as promised, not break um, old WebAssembly, there will also be some way to future test the running engine. So the engine can actually decide if it should run the SIMD version or a slower but still working uh, version that does the operations one by one. And this will be natively in WebAssembly. So basically, you tell your tool chain, please produce SIMD code, um, but at the same time, produce the normal code, ship both to the browser, and let the engine decide what's best to run. And even though WebAssembly is not bound to the browser environment, that's pretty much its first target. And thus, needless integration into the existing DOM and web APIs will be necessary to make this all work. We have a lot of great uh, web APIs in the browser that uh, allow for a lot of interesting applications. But currently, you always have to go through JavaScript, from your WebAssembly through JavaScript to these APIs. And this is really slow at the moment. So you don't gain a lot if you ca call uh, back and from to WebAssembly into JavaScript. But there will be native support in WebAssembly as well. So if you're a native developer, the web is now just a compiler target away. Most code that you already wrote in C or in Rust, you can now run on the web. If you're a web developer, on the other hand, you can now leverage the enormous world of native libraries. There's no need anymore to rewrite a huge library um, in JavaScript just to get it running. You can now use it as is, compile it to the web, and run it in the browser. But what this means is that both these worlds, which are pretty close, uh, pretty far away, um, they have to learn from each other to make the most out of this. So if you want to know more, um, go to webassembly.org. If you want to play around with uh, this from the Rust side, go to hellorust.com slash wasn. Um, I will also upload the slides there. And with that, thank you. If you have questions, you can still ask or find me outside after the talk. Hello, nice talk. Um, I have some question. Uh, what, what is currently uh, uh, natively accessible from the WebAssembly environment? Is there anything besides just the memory that you can access? 
Um, at the moment, um, you can still call into the JavaScript web APIs. Um, it's just that at the moment it's a bit slow. Um, otherwise, there are not that man there are no APIs implemented right now. Like right now, we only have the bare minimum of WebAssembly running. Um, the best way you can use it right now would be to actually do a whole lot of computation in WebAssembly and return the result um, in some way to JavaScript and run it there. Um, there is a big community group meeting at the end of this month where they probably will stabilize some of the APIs. So by the end of the month, we will probably see the first uh, implementations of access to native AT APIs. So, so you mentioned that this, this JavaScript bridge is really slow at the moment. So M scripting is already used now for like, uh, like physics engines, like porting them to JavaScript. Will that be like a future of like that WebAssembly will do that, or can you better run your entire game than inside of WebAssembly because you, your bridge is too heavy always? I don't know. Um, so at the moment, um, you would still switch in between. Um, but once we gain these APIs we can natively run it fully in WebAssembly, which will probably be uh, the best. Um, but there will always be a way to call back into JavaScript. And this will still be necessary because JavaScript is still the language on the web. So for some things, we still need to call back into WebAssembly. But one of the major problems is right now is that none of the JavaScript engines know about WebAssembly by themselves. So there's a lot of hacks in the engine to make this work. But once we stabilize these, the hacks will become um, actual good code, and then the um, overhead will go away. Yeah. And um, actually, right now, um, what you could also do to actually support the broadest uh, um, amount of browsers is just ship both. Both, ship both the ASMJS version, for those that don't know WebAssembly, um, which should reasonably work, um, and ship the WebAssembly version for those that are already ahead. Hey, thanks for your talk. Yeah, in the beginning, you mentioned something uh, about that it's not a good idea for languages that compile to JavaScript to compile down to, uh, I think you were talking about ASM still, not about WebAssembly, but... Uh, can you elaborate on that, why that's the case? Sure. Um, the thing is, if you're compiling to JavaScript, you're already making use of the semantics and the environment around JavaScript, which largely means you probably have a garbage collected uh, language there. Um, and if you take the language that already has a garbage collector, compile all of it to WebAssembly, and combine that into an engine that actually wants JavaScript with its own garbage collector. You now have two con uh, currently running garbage collectors in your browser interacting with each other, and you will probably run into problems there. And the overhead, overhead of this is just not worth it. All right, thanks. OK. You can uh, still find me outside if you have any more questions. Um, Thank you.